Okay, um, so today, obviously you guys got the handout, so you know that today's the portfolio day. Um, this is, welcome to the week before finals week, I guess. If, if they call next week finals week, I don't know. With the new calendar, I'm a little confused, just like I'm sure all of you are. Uh, okay, so today we're gonna talk portfolios. You're gonna spend time drawing and working on your portfolio. Um, and then on Wednesday, we'll go back into SketchUp and do some SketchUp and Photoshop collage work. And then we'll do some more SketchUp Photoshop collage work on Monday. And then your final portfolio is due. So essentially, your portfolio is due in a little over a week. Today is the time to kind of get it figured out. Um, you know, you guys have lots of other things to do. You have lots of finals coming. Um, now is a good time. And my goal today is to have you work on your cover and think about binding options and, and talk through that but also to spend time with each and every one of you, assuming you want to, uh, to look at your portfolio and see where it is and, and see if you, you feel like you can improve it a little bit. Um, don't forget the portfolio is worth 30% of your overall grade, which means it's a really big piece. I've seen people who have an A going into the portfolio do a terrible job on the portfolio and drop their grade significantly in the class. It happens. Likewise, people go into the portfolio not doing that well, do an excellent job on their portfolio, and bring their grade up. And it's a big chunk, um, and that's the nature of it. It's, it's a final for the class. So it's certainly something that you can, um, you can create your own fate, so to speak. Uh, so we're going to talk portfolios uh, at length today, mostly about covers and binding options. Uh, but if you guys have any specific questions, we can go through that. Uh, as well. If you feel like your portfolio is well, un, uh, well underway, you've got it all kind of sorted out, feel free to work on your, um, your SketchUp model if you want to. So there's no reason you should be leaving early today or, or you know, working on other things. There's plenty to do for this particular class. Uh, many of you have already turned in your assignment 105s. I do know that the plotter is out of yellow ink. I've asked uh, uh, Chi if she has a key to the office, which she doesn't. So as soon as I can get that office unlocked, I will replace the yellow cartridge, and then we can plot some more. Uh, for those of you that are in that, uh, that boat, the good news is that I won't hold it against you. It won't be late for you. The bad news, or the semi-bad news, is that recognize that this happens and that if this had been a class where you had to do a presentation on the wall or something and you had no drawing, that would be a bad thing. So plan ahead next time and make sure that it's not out of yellow toner, um, et cetera. So let's talk portfolio covers and uh, binding options. So first off, I think the first question is, what really belongs on a cover? And I think there is one essential thing that absolutely has to go on the cover of a portfolio, and that is your name. It should be obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people forget to do something like that. So you should have your name on it. It should probably be your full name, uh, not your you know, email handle or something. It should be your full name, because this is representative of your work. Uh, frequently, people put other things on it besides their name. They might say, Grant Adams, portfolio. Sometimes there's a requirement. Uh, when I applied to grad school way back when, now it's not even a, a physical portfolio that you turn in, it's a digital portfolio, so it's changed. But when I applied, you had to put on what you were applying for. So I had to say option two candidate on my portfolio. That was a requirement. So sometimes there are requirements. But you should have your full name, and then you could put things like portfolio, design portfolio, architecture portfolio, selected works, architecture works, uh, you know, design works, industrial design, whatever. You can put something else if you want. That's optional. You can also include a year or a date range. The advantage of including a date range or a year is it's saying that this is where I am today and this is the work that I've done today. And then if you redo the portfolio, maybe it's a new version of the portfolio, you can say this is you know, the next set of date ranges. Alex Holgreff, the guy that I've talked about before from visualizingarchitecture.com, uh, he does his portfolios in volumes. He has a volume one, a volume two, a volume three, and a volume four. So you could do it that way. He produces an incredible amount of work, so doing it in volumes kind of seems to make sense. Um, sometimes just work year ranges or just the year is a good way of kind of summarizing where you are. So I'm going to break these into categories. I'm going to show you first examples with just text. 
And when possible, I've tried to make the portfolio the full side of the projection screen, uh, just so you can see it. So this one, architecture portfolio, and the, the person's name. There's a little bit of a graphic logo there, but essentially this is just text. Another example here, just the person's name. Again, that's, that's critical. And interior architect. This one, interior design. They put their little signature there. The signature or the initials or whatever works if you have a really nice signature. Uh, I mean, it sounds silly, right? But like for me personally, it wouldn't work. My signature wouldn't look good on a cover. Like it's not, I don't have this kind of flowing script and the right letters in my name to make a really cool uh, signature. It works really nice for her. So be aware that you have to, you have to kind of self-evaluate and say, is mine good enough to really go on a cover? Does it, is it going to look nice? Is it going to graphically feel good? Um, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes people combine logos with their, with their name and or just some text. Uh, this one included a phone number and an email address. So that may or may not be something that's important to you. I would argue that the phone number and email address really belongs on the, the next page. That's just me. Um, you could tell that this guy is kind of a web designer. The, the whole layout feels web design-y. Again, mostly text, the one graphic. Architecture folio, I don't know. Some people call it a folio. I don't, I, that, that bugs me a little bit. But it, you know, this is the thing about a portfolio. It's a personal thing. You have to see what represents you the best. You know, if somebody in my class turned this in, I wouldn't grade it down because I didn't like that it said folio instead of portfolio. Okay, It's a personal thing. So you just need to be aware of that kind of, uh, that kind of change and make sure it represents you. So examples, this one is going to be text with some kind of an abstract background. So all the previous ones were just plain backgrounds. So as we move forward into the abstract backgrounds, it's some, something that gives us some shadow or some, some excitement going on on the cover, but we can't really tell what it is. So I couldn't tell you what this is. It's obviously some kind of a model that he made, but I don't know what the project is. I don't know how it's relevant to anything that he's done, but it gives us kind of an abstract background. He did a nice job by carrying some of the shadow lines through uh, I think it works nicely. But again, name, design portfolio. That's it. Another example here with kind of the abstract shape. To me, the 2013 portfolio is a little bit too thick, too big, too emphasized compared to the name. And I don't like that it's at the top versus the name at the bottom. I think you could, you could work and massage that a little bit. Another example here. Uh, with kind of the ink splot, you've got the wood grain texture behind. Um, for me personally, the drop shadow, the, the name on the sticker drop shadowed on top, eh, it's a little corny. I'm just saying. You know, and that's something that you have to be aware of. I like this one a lot. I think it's a really tastefully done uh, portfolio. The only challenge with this is it works great in digital form, but if you went to print this out, the letters are so thin, especially in the smaller, all right, the 2014 undergraduate architectural, that text, that they would bleed together, especially if you did it on an inkjet versus a laser. You're just not going to see enough crispness in that white to make it stand out. So something like that, when you print it, you're going to realize that the font needs to be thicker. Um, so it's something worth thinking about. Uh, portfolio here, uh, the cork background. I have a really hard time reading portfolio here. It's there, P-O-R-T-F-O-L-I-O. -O. You know, but I don't know. Somehow it's just graphically difficult. It's it's all there. Uh, so be just be aware that sometimes you can get a little too creative. Uh, sometimes people use an abstract background, something like this, where you've got kind of a plan view behind. You've got a technical drawing behind. Um, this, this can work, but you have to have created this kind of a technical drawing for it to work. 
Um, one of the other problems that I've seen in the past, and this really surprised me when, the, when this happened, is that people went on Google and found images of architectural stuff and put that on the cover of their portfolio. Do you think that's a good idea? No, no. It's not your work. The portfolio is fundamentally about you. So the fact that you can Google search somebody else's work is not the, the skill that you want to display. So make sure it is about you. So if you don't have the real technical drawing that looks good in this abstract form, don't, don't do it. Sometimes people do it out of actual metal or, or acrylic. Um, if you have that area of expertise, then it might make sense. Um, the challenge with something like this is it becomes kind of a very heavy, awkward book. You know, the edges are sharp, and you have to think about people handling it and, and whatever. Uh, but if you have a lot of metal work skill, maybe you do want to include something like that. Another example here with the abstract backgrounds, I think this one's really nicely done. Abstract uh, photography background, just the concrete texture behind. This makes sense that this is an urban design person because we're seeing kind of the, the Noli plan of Rome street map set up behind. This is the front and back. I think it's kind of interesting that there's, there's a barcode included. I've seen this done, this, the skyline. Um, in fact, I have a couple of them. Uh, so it's not something that's, that's unique and, and new, but certainly something that has been done nicely. This was Alex Holgreff's volume three of his portfolio. It does have some of his project work. It does have some of his drawing. But it's done in a way that's very abstract. You're not seeing just a picture of his, his work. You're, it's sliced up, and it, it's made a little bit um, faded out, et cetera. So in this case, this is the spine in the center, and this would be the back cover and the front cover, and it wraps around the book. So he's conceiving the whole cover. And then I'll move on to examples with a work or project background. And again, if you're going to do this, you want to make sure that whatever the work is, is really, really good. If it's going to go on the cover, uh, you know, it better be good. So, and it's also going to be very representative of who you are and the kind of work that you're interested in doing. So if you're not interested in doing this kind of ornate design work, having that on the cover isn't necessarily the right direction to go. So be aware. If you're not really into sketching or you're not really good at sketching, you probably don't want to put a sketch on the front cover. In this particular example, it's a beautiful sketch. And it's done really nicely. The, the line weights are done nicely. It works great as a cover because she's really good at it, or he's really good at it. I don't know. He, I bet it's a he, is really good at it. So be aware of that when you're deciding what goes on the front. Another example here. This is some kind of a model that was photographed. This really could have gone in the abstract versus the actual works. It's a little bit uh, of a toss up under what category it would go in. The, the red in this one is a little bit challenging. I like this a lot. I think it's a beautifully done cover. Uh, you've got the trace overlay. It's a photograph of the trace and the drawings that have been set up uh, in kind of a nice composition. It works beautifully well as a front cover. It gives you the sense of the technical drawing, the sketch drawing, the process, and that sort of thing. The project has to be good enough, too. It has to be a good enough project to warrant going on the front with the right amount of sketching, etc. Kind of the 3D rendering front cover. I think there was a time where this one really felt good. I think it feels a little sketchy right now. Text with a model background. If you're really good at model making, sometimes this is a good strategy. I think this one's really cool. It's, a, it's an all black. They've done a nice job of cutting out just the light part of the object so that the rest of the cover is a deep, dark black. Uh, and then you have the little, the little model existing in the corner. It's well composed, too. This person must be interested in kind of 3D CAD CAM routering, that sort of thing, 
to put something like this on the cover, you want to emphasize that that's your, your interest. The other thing that you can do is you can do cutouts. So you could use a laser cutter and you could cut things out. Uh, this is done with a sheet of acrylic uh, where you're removing parts of it. I have a few examples that I pulled um, that I'll talk briefly about, uh, even though they're not on the, um, on the slides here. Oops. I thought I grabbed that one where students have done it. Hold on a second. Walk to the back here. I just missed grabbing them. Here's two examples that students have done using the laser cutters here at DVC. Uh, this first one is the skyline. Sorry, I'm walking backwards so you guys can see it. It's the skyline look where they cut out the skyline. It's done out of just like four ply, black four ply. The advantage of the black is that you don't see the burn marks on it. Um, but you can also do the etching. So in this case, the portfolio and, and the person's name was etched out of the black. This is another one that's older. I kept this one not because of the portfolio itself. I think the portfolio itself is not that great, but the cover is really nicely done with the etching. Um, so those are two examples of, of, of etching work that you could do uh, for the cover of the portfolio. Uh, and again, I'll put all of these in the back. We move from here. Oh, there's another example of, of a cutout. I don't actually have one of the acrylic cutouts to show you. Nobody's ever done an acrylic, but you could do this on the laser cutter the same way. The advantage of the acrylic is that the cutouts don't have burn marks because it actually melts th through the plastic. So in those two examples, they bought a little metal bracket with some hinges and screws and did it that way. Uh, so it's hinged. If It's always a little iffy, um, but some Depending on the quality of the print shop, some print shops might be able to actually bind through it, um, but it might break the plastic too. Uh, if, you were, if you were doing the binding, you could cut the little holes. You could laser cut the little holes in. Uh, if you knew what the spacing of the holes was and you wanted it to be bound, you could cut that. And then when you took it to the binding shop, it would already have the holes in it, and they could just do the spiral. Um, you could get creative about how it was glued together too, depending on how you wanted to make it. Um, so you bring a good point by asking that, because the next thing I want to talk about are binding options. <laughs> uh, so thanks for transitioning perfectly for me. Um, and so we have our traditional bindings. These are the ones that are available at Staples and Office Max and Kinko's or FedEx or whatever it's called now, um, which is typically what people do when they go uh, to have these things bound. Um, in the back of a large number of the portfolios, I'll see if I can pull one up here. And of course, the one I picked doesn't have it in it. Uh, I ask every year for students to put a sticky note in the back, of course, right? All the ones that I'm trying to grab don't have them. You guys have probably seen them when you, this when you one which one, this one? Yeah. OK, thank you. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So I ask students to put a little sticky note inside or a little label on it somewhere uh, that says where they had it done where they had the binding done and how much it cost. Because people always come to me afterward and they say, I really like this binding. Where'd they have it done? I don't know. So uh, that should help. Um, I had one student last semester. Uh, it was this student, Ming Ho. Uh, he had his printed at FedEx and was extraordinarily unhappy with the results and how much it cost. I think, it, I think he said it cost like $45 to have it done. And it was really not done very well. And after the semester was over, he found a different print shop uh, called Minuteman Press. It was in Lafayette. And he went to them and said, look, I really want to get this done. And he made a bunch of copies, which is why the, the price tag on here is, is so high. Um, but he said it was actually ended up being fairly inexpensive. I think it was said it was like 10 or $12. And they did full bleed, and the quality of the printing and the binding was really nice. So he came back, gave me one of the replacement ones to include and also uh, the contact information of the, publish, the publishing house. So it's there if you guys want uh, that. And I wanted to make sure that I forwarded that information on to you. So moving on, uh, one of the major types and the most common, if you look at all the sample portfolios that I have, is the spiral bind. It's usually plastic, though it could be made out of metal. Uh, the big problem with this is it causes misalignment of the interior 
of the book. Um, and I think maybe the next slide I have an example here, right? So across the top, you see how that black bar jumps one page to the other? Anytime you have something that flows across a page, like this, when you go to open it, this doesn't line up with that because of the way the spiral opens. So if you had an image that went across pages like this and it was spiral bound, this side of the image wouldn't match with that side of the image, which is a big problem. And it's certainly something to be aware of as you're setting that up. So I'll show you this one in a second. So that's the big disadvantage of a spiral. It's really good for one-sided books. It's certainly a convenient binding because it, it turns really nice. When you open a spiral, it turns really nice. It's easy to fold it over. Like It's a nice binding. It just causes that misalignment. The other thing to be aware of is it takes about a quarter of an inch off of the page with all of these little holes. So if you, if you had this text, and the text was right over here, and you punched all these little holes through it, you wouldn't be able to read it anymore. So be aware that it takes space out of the center of your, your book when you do this kind of a binding, though that's pretty much the case with all of them. So the big disadvantage is the misalignment across the top. The comb binding can be a metal binding or it can be a plastic binding. Um, the truth is, I think the plastic ones are kind of ugly. This is an example of the plastic one here. Um, it ends up somehow being kind of chunky. Uh, the metal ones tend to be a little bit more elegant. Uh, Staples used to have a great metal one that I really liked, and then they discontinued it. So it is what it is. The, um, the advantage here is that there are not alignment issues. So when you go to open something and you have an image that goes across the page, like the one I just showed you, and of course now I won't be able to find one. Yeah, it's something like this. Where you have the image that goes across the page, it stays in a line. It doesn't jump up. Uh, on one side or the other. So that can be a big advantage, and you want to think about that. Uh, like I said, the metal one's a little bit thinner. The other thing that can happen is sometimes when you go to the print shop, they put too small of a binding in. In this case, the, the binding itself was a little bit too small for the number of pages in the, the book. Um, and so that then obviously impacts how easy it is to turn. That makes this one a little bit more challenging to turn. It still takes about a quarter inch out of the center of the page. There's the metal ones. You see that they're a little bit nicer. A lot of uh, notebooks, not the spiral notebooks, obviously, but uh, some of the notebooks that you write in for your English class or whatever have this kind of a binding. Uh, and they can be really clean and really nice. Another example there. Another example there. So then we get into the handmade or the specialty bindings. Uh, and I really wish, I used to have my grad school portfolio as one of these portfolios. Somebody walked off with it, so I don't have that one anymore. Um, but you can actually make your own binding. And you can think about how to, how to create a binding that, that looks really nice. Uh, generally, it involves glue. It could involve some staples. Uh, when I did my grad school one, uh, I printed on both sides of the page. I s put everything together nice and neat, nice and straight. And I stapled three times through the pages on the end. Then, you know how staples have those extra little curls on them? I didn't want those curls to be there anymore. So I took a pair of pliers and I flattened out all the little curls so it was perfectly flat. And then I put a uh, cover of uh, watercolor paper over, over it and then wrapped around the binding. I scored it and folded it really carefully so it was the right look. This is why I wish I still had it because I could show you how it works. Uh, and then it folded all the way around and made the back cover. That then I glued into place over the top of the staples so you couldn't see it. So it would open and it looked like a book binding. It was a really nice, uh, clean book binding. So that's certainly something that you can do. Some print shops have versions of this. In this case, it's kind of a cloth tape that goes over the top uh, that you can do. The advantage there is things still stay in line, uh, but you don't have the spiral in the center anymore. Um, so you can, you can do it that way. This one, which I keep around, is one of the least expensive portfolios that's ever been turned in. Uh, she uh, printed it at the school lab. It cost her about $5. And she actually hand sewed the binding together. So it has thread, and she sewed it together. Uh, and it works really nice, and it's been very durable. You can open the pages all the way. 
uh, it's, it's, it's nicely done. So this one's here for you guys to see as well. So there's nothing wrong with trying to make your own uh, little binding. Here's another example of the one with those tape bindings. So you can do something like that. Um, a lot of the print shops put that first piece of plastic on the front. That's fine. Um, but that's a, that's a personal preference. So here's another example of one of those tape bindings. So the advantage here is if you did this kind of a cover, uh, where you were doing your own cover and you folded the paper around or the watercolor paper is you can print all the way across and around the book, kind of the way Alex Holgraft would have done. There's examples um, of, of different papers. Hand sewn, there's little these little clips in the corners that hold it together. This is a professional one. If you guys had more time uh, on your portfolio, if you were applying to grad school or something, although I think everybody takes digital portfolios now, uh, but you could actually send your portfolio out to a print shop, a professional print shop, and they could make it uh, and send it back to you. They could make it hardcover, they could make it softcover, uh, and it would look like a professional book. That's beyond the scope of what we uh, would do in the class. Another example here of kind of a different way of folding the pages together. And that's it. So what I wanted to do today was to emphasize the different uh, covers, to emphasize the different binding options. I have all of these portfolios uh, that you guys have seen before, but now it might be more relevant in the back here. I believe most of these are A portfolios. There's probably some Bs in here as well. I try to call out anything that's, that's worse than that, so you're not seeing that uh, as an example. Um, take some time, look at the bindings, kind of get a good sense for what feels right to you. Uh, knowing going forward. The other thing that I would caution you against is if you walk in next Wednesday to FedEx at 7 in the morning and say, will you make my portfolio and bind it for me, they probably won't have enough time. They tend to, tend to be a little slow in the process. So start the binding early, like maybe this weekend would be a good plan to do it. So you need to be kind of on top of it and moving forward uh, with it. And that's part of why I'm doing today the portfolio day. So this is Monday. It's due a week from Wednesday. If you finish it this week and have it bound this weekend, that's a pretty good trajectory for where we're going. OK? Anybody have any questions about portfolios or, or anything like global questions? No? OK, sounds good. I will, um, I'll be here, obviously, all day. If you want me to sit with you and talk about your portfolio in specifics, I would love to do that. Um, obviously, the more done it is, the easier it is to talk about. Um, if it's just kind of barely in process, it's harder to, to give good feedback. Uh, if you feel like you're done with your portfolio or don't really want to work on it and you would rather work on your, um, your SketchUp model, that's OK too. But I think today would be a good time to, to really finish up your portfolio if I were advising you. OK, um, with that, I will stop and let you guys go to work.